Have you ever wondered how the world looks through the eyes of an animal? Animals can see things that we can only imagine. Imagine how much more we would know about our environment and the way it's changing if we could see what animals see. I'm an ecologist and a conservation biologist, and I study how animals are responding to global change and what we can do about it. Now, having a bird's eye view is not only possible, it's actually an incredibly valuable tool for science as we study global change. We all know we're living in a global biodiversity crisis, which scientists call the fifth mass extinction on our planet. We're losing species 100 to 1,000 times faster than the pre-industrial extinction rate. At the same time, we also know that our environment is changing at an unprecedented pace due to global climate change, but also from a variety of other human activities like pollution, overexploitation, and land conversion. In order to understand how our environment is changing, why it's changing the way that it is, and what we can do about it, we need to be able to collect large amounts of data on our Earth over, over large spatial scales quickly, efficiently, and cost-effectively. Traditionally, our data collection approaches fall into one of two categories. First, we go out and we collect the data ourselves. This can give us really precise measurements on what we're trying to study, and it, we can also collect information on many different types of things all in one place. But this approach, require, approach requires a lot of person power, and it can be costly and very slow, especially for collecting data in hard-to-reach places, like the poles or the middle of the ocean. It can be sometimes dangerous for the people going out and collecting those data. And it's difficult to get information over broad spatial scales. So in contrast, the other way that we traditionally collect Earth observation data is through satellite remote sensing. This involves sending a satellite up into Earth's orbit, which then collects data every time it passes over an area. This can be extremely cost-effective for collecting data over large spatial scales, and these data are often freely and publicly available. But one of the major drawbacks of this approach is that because the satellites have to look down through Earth's atmosphere, we often get large gaps in our data due to cloud cover that obscure the view. So this is an image of ocean chlorophyll taken from a satellite just a few days ago. And these white gaps, white areas, are from cloud cover. And you can see that we get, we're missing almost half of the picture here. And this is especially problematic in areas like the Arctic and the Antarctic, where you get almost complete cloud cover most days of the year. Yet, ironically, are two of the most important areas for us to be monitoring climate-driven changes. So this is a big problem. We need to be thinking about creative and innovative ways to fill in the gaps from our traditional data collection approaches. This is where I think animals can come in. Whether, um, think about how much a whale sees as it navigates between oceans, or how much a cheetah sees as it navigates across its landscape. This is an image from one of the study cheetahs that my colleagues and I radio tracked during my PhD research in Botswana. And we now have a new tool just in the last decade as our technology improves that allows us to start using animal tracking for Earth observation. I first got started with animal tracking when I joined an organization called the Botswana Predator Conservation Trust and started radio tracking large carnivores as part of my PhD research. And before that, I was actually a physics major in college, but eventually I discovered that I enjoyed studying animals more than I enjoyed studying electrons and made the switch over to ecology when I entered graduate school. And I'd just like to say that everything I've done since then and everything I'm going to talk about today is the result of teamwork and collaborations, which are essential to any scientific field, and maybe especially environmental problem solving. This is a photo from our field team in Botswana. And doing field work on the ground here in Africa is where I first began seeing that whether swimming, walking, or flying, animals are constantly monitoring their environment and are an untapped resource 
for helping us understand how the environment is changing and what the state of the environment is in ways that would be otherwise very difficult for us to measure. Now, this isn't an entirely new concept. We've all heard the phrase, the canary in the coal mine, which comes from coal miners throughout the 20th century relying on canaries to tell them and alert them about poor air quality conditions down in the mine shafts. We also have more modern day um, examples that appear in our pop culture, even though we might not think about it. You know that moment in horror movies where the protagonists realize that something strange is going on because the animals are doing something strange? Here's an example. In the same direction. I feel like you're running away. From what? <laughs> and you just know something bad is about to happen? We've been using animals as our watchmen for centuries. But only now, with massive improvements in our technology and our data analytics, can we begin using wildlife around the world as our global canaries in the coal mine and collect data for us on a scale we've never been able to do in the past. So how does this work? Say we want a whale that's swimming around the ocean to be collecting data for us. We fix a satellite tag on it, which then communicates with a satellite or one or more satellites up in Earth's orbit, and then that transmits information down to us on that animal's position at regular time intervals. What we end up with is something like this, which is an animation of satellite tracking data that was collected from blue whales that I've used in several of my studies with colleagues from Oregon State University. And you can see that we get really fine scale detailed information about where these animals are going in their environment. Now that I'm an ecologist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I study how marine predators, like this cute northern elephant seal here, are responding to changes in the ocean. And for the last several years, I've worked with colleagues from the University of California, Santa Cruz, to study the ecology of this species. Northern elephant seals breed along the coast of California, and then after their pups are weaned, the females disappear for months on end. Well, where do they go? We never really knew until we put satellite tags on these animals, and we saw that these females are actually performing massive migrations and swimming thousands of miles out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean to feed out there for months, for months at a time before returning home. We never knew exactly where they went or that they performed migrations on this massive of a scale until we were able to track them. But satellite tracking like this doesn't only tell us amazing and fascinating things about the species that we're studying, it also tells us about the, their surrounding environment in ways that we wouldn't know otherwise. As an example, we've all heard how we shouldn't eat certain types of fish too often because of mercury concentrations. Um, but one of the big unanswered questions with, uh, about mercury has been, where does it come from in the ocean? How is it distributed? And especially, how is it distributed below the, earth, the ocean surface, which is difficult for us to monitor? Well, my colleagues from UC Santa Cruz tried to tackle that question by, by sampling the blubber of elephant seals after they returned from their migration. And by combining the measurements that they got from their blubber with knowing where they actually went in the ocean, they were able to spatially map mercury bioaccumulation across the Pacific Basin. What they found was that seals that foraged further south and in deeper waters accumulated more mercury. Well, why does this matter? Mercury is toxic to both humans and wildlife, and knowing how mercury is distributed in the ocean gives us a lot of valuable information. For example, it tells us which animals and species are most likely to be exposed to mercury, it tells us humans what areas to avoid fishing in that could lead to our own mercury exposure, and it helps us pinpoint areas in the ocean where there might be more mercury leakage. But this data would have been really difficult for us to collect, both because these seals are covering such vast distances, and also because they're foraging hundreds of kilometers or hundreds of meters below the ocean surface. And so they're able to get data for us in areas that would be very difficult for us to reach. For reasons like this, marine predators are often considered sentinels for the health of our oceans, 
much like canaries were considered sentinels for air quality in coal mines. Have you ever thought about putting a Fitbit on an animal? We can do that now too. We can now use things called biologgers, which are additional sensors that we attach to our satellite tags to collect data for us beyond just where an animal is going. For example, during my PhD research, we fitted accelerometers and magnetometers on African carnivores, which are the same technology that are in our smartphones and our Fitbits, that could tell us not only where the animal went, but precisely what activity it was doing in each of those locations. As we saw from the first video, we can now put video cameras on all sorts of different animals and learn more about their behaviors, their habitats, and their interactions with other animals. One really cool study out of San Jose State University put air quality sensors on pigeons, and by doing so, we're able to map air quality throughout Silicon Valley. And we can also put similar environmental sensors on diving predators and learn about different variables below the ocean surface, like temperature at different depths. And using these environmental sensors can help us collect data and monitor environmental processes in particularly hard to reach places. One of the things we're particularly concerned about is sea ice melt and sea ice retraction in the Arctic and the Antarctic. But because of those cloud cover issues I mentioned, as well as the fact that it's difficult to collect data below sea ice and below the ocean surface, it's hard for us to monitor these processes from traditional sources like satellite imagery or surveys. So colleagues from the University of St. Andrews turned to southern elephant seals to help them map ocean temperature below the ocean surface around Antarctica. This is a map that they made of all available traditional data sources for temperature below 500 meters. So this includes everything from shipboard surveys to floating devices and satellite imagery. You can notice that there are quite a number of gaps here, especially around the, the Antarctica, the continent of Antarctica. And we can see that we can look at these gaps that we still have. And now we can add in data that were collected by instrumenting southern elephant seals with temperature sensors as they swam and foraged around these areas. And when we do so, we see that we get over a 50% improvement in our data coverage of those gaps. And so we can see that by using environmental sensors and animal tracking, we literally get, we literally can help fill in the gaps from our traditional data collection sources. So animal tracking and satellite technology not, not only help us understand more about our environment and our ecosystems, but it also helps us cons better conserve those animals themselves. By tracking animals, animals can tell us through their movements and behavior exactly what habitats they need, where areas of greatest danger are for them, and whether the conservation strategies that we put in place for them are working. At the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I'm working with colleagues there and a number of other partners to try to reduce the threat of ship strikes to blue whales along the U.S. West Coast, where ship strikes are the number one cause of mortality for this endangered species. But one of the big challenges with this effort is that we can't protect the whales from ships if we don't know where the whales are. So we use satellite tracks from, collected from blue whales and machine learning approaches to understand exactly what habitats and ocean conditions these whales prefer. And by doing so, we're now able to predict on any given day, based on, based on that day's ocean conditions, where those whales are most likely to be. And these predictions can now be incorporated into NOAA's whale advisory that tells ships when and where to slow down based on, based on the risk of collision with a whale. Having worked on animals that are large, like lions and whales, where our satellite tags are the size of, of at least the size of a baseball, it's pretty amazing to see satellite trackers engineered small enough now to be able to place on tiny, tiny animals like bees. 
And from data like these, we can get so much more information about our ecosystems and critical ecosystem processes that animals provide, like pollination. Just like our computers, as technology improves, our satellite tracking devices are getting smaller and smaller. And as a consequence, the number of species and taxa that we're able to track is growing exponentially. The field of animal movement ecology is breaking boundaries in our ability to protect and understand and conserve our environment and ecosystems. Compared to many other scientific fields, this field is still in its infancy, but it's rapidly growing. And for any students in the room who are interested in environmental problem solving, there are still so many unanswered questions in this field and many different ways to plug into it. These are just a few. And this area is ripe for new ideas and exploration. Thank you.